and welcome to another What's the Point? Our discussion of economic development in Wyoming, where we look at how do we utilize policy and funding mechanisms in order to really build that local capacity within the communities in Wyoming to build resilience and make sure that we can weather really any storm. And uh, with me today, I have Sam Kleikman of Big Lost Meadery. So we're enjoying Howdy. some mead today. Sam? Yeah, no, thanks for having me, Josh. Uh, excited to be here. Thanks for the opportunity to talk to you. But uh, yeah, no, we're excited to be a part of this little project. Good. Well, so Sam, tell, tell us a little bit about mead and what that means. Yeah, great question. So mead is essentially fermented honey, right? Okay. And so we take raw honey, we add water to it, we ferment it out and turn it into some sort of alcohol on the other end. And so mead can be made like a beer, like a wine, like a spirit, or like something else. We would kind of fall in that something else category. All right. Uh, we're kind of halfway between a wine and a liquor-ish, mm -hmm. real strong on the ish, and we're kind of our own world. You know, there's only a few of us in the, in the world that make the style of mead that we do. Nice. Um, you know, it's the oldest fermented beverage on the planet, and they have records of it in ancient Samaria, ancient Africa, ancient China, ancient Mesoamerica, you know, all independently developed well before the advent of wine or beer. And we decided in Gillette, Wyoming, of all places, we were yeah. going to start a little uh, mead mecca nice. and build something that state never seen before. So um, your background, is it in, uh, in business or in, uh, you know, spirits or what is it? No, not at all. Uh, I've been a fireman my whole life. So I'm okay. a fireman by trade. Uh, my business partner, Bob, he's a teacher by trade. Uh, we just, is one of those things, I was kind of looking for a new path. I knew my body wasn't going to last another 30 years doing what I was doing. Yeah. I lived fairly hard for a while. Yeah. And so I was looking to start a brewery because I've been doing some, you know, home mm -hmm. brewery and stuff like that. But everybody and their dog had breweries and there was very high quality breweries around that yeah. there's no way I could compete with that. Okay. And so I was doing some mead stuff and actually the way it started, uh, during this whole homebrew process, a guy asked me if I would make meat, and I told him, no. Too expensive, takes too much time, not worth the effort. He's like, well, you know, I got a guy, he makes honey, he wants somebody to make mead with it, so if he sells you a bunch of honey at cost, would you try it? It's like, okay, so I'll give it a shot. So I bought 125 pounds of honey off this guy, having never made mead before, made a whole barrel of it, turned out great, and then just kind of quit making beer and wine, just started making mead. And so when it came time to like figure out a business plan, I figured, you know, let's try something new. Instead of trying to steal a market, let's build a whole new market that didn't exist. Right. And yeah, kind of threw out the fire helmet and started working on making yeah. this. Nice, nice. And so you've been working in Wyoming predominantly, or how, tell me the path to commercialization, right? Like getting yeah. into the market. Um, so it's been kind of a, a non-traditional path, if you will. So okay. the whole goal out of the gate was to get into distribution on a national scale. That's, right. that's always been the goal that ever has since day one. Um, and so with that, we started just in Gillette. So we bought an old building. It's actually the original general store in town. Okay. It's actually a picture of it right there. <laughs> uh, it burned down in 1895, burned down again in 1929, rebuilt in 1931, and then we moved into it in 2014. Uh, it had been a whole myriad of things since then. And so, yeah, we had this tasting room and literally all we had was mead and drinking horns. We had no glassware. We had no non-alcoholic. We had no beer. We had no nothing. Like you came in, you had mead with horns. That's all you had. Not the best decision as far as like, you know, overall customer satisfaction <laughs> over time. Uh, but it was a good experience. And then, you know, we started making mead, getting into the process, we started bottling right out of the gate. Okay. Um, and then about six months after we opened, we started doing sales. And so, and I'd never done sales before. So I was literally get in my little Chevy Malibu and just start driving around the state, selling stuff out of the back of my car. And, you know, started off in Sheridan. Um, yeah, Star Liquor was my very first account outside okay. of our in-house. And then, yeah, we started moving around, got into distribution in Wyoming. Um, and so, yeah, by the end of 2015, we were in North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming. We were selling all over the state into retail accounts, bars, liquor stores, restaurants. Uh, we had increased what we were doing in house. So we added glassware, which is a huge step you would never really think about. Um, and then in 2016, we expanded again. And so we moved to off site production facility. Okay. And so when we moved off site, then we had this whole former tasting room. And so we put a brewery in there and started making beer to increase our product lines for the tasting room. Um, because in that old facility, we didn't have concrete floors, we didn't have a forklift. And we buy honey in 55 gallon drums that, you know, they weigh over 700 pounds. So like trying to move 700 pounds by hand, 
And like a little lip in the floor of a quarter inch is a big deal. It's a big deal. Yeah. Big deal. Yep. And so we finally got our goal of a concrete floor and a forklift. Um, so yeah, we expanded there. And then 2018, we expanded again to a larger facility. Um, and then came the COVID world. And so during COVID, you know, it hit our industry very hard. So a lot of small mom and pop places. And uh, we decided to do an expansion again during COVID. Actually ended up being very good for us. COVID was productive. So we expanded into our current facility because we were running a tasting room brewery and an offsite production facility. Combined those two okay. together into where we are now in a single facility. Increased our tasting room, added a restaurant with some partners. And so done that whole side. But during those, you know, over that eight years, we expanded into six different states worth of distribution. We've got 42 different states that we ship direct to household to. Mm -hmm. And we also expanded in the Asian market. Right. And so we're currently selling in Taiwan. Okay. Um, that all started pre-COVID. COVID shut down absolutely everything on the Taiwanese market. And then we started again in 2021, getting that up and going. And we are currently looking into, uh, we got meetings in Hong Kong, Thailand, and we're looking at some other parts of Southeast Asia using Taiwan as our toll hold. Okay. Um, but one of the things about like how we actually got into Asia is Wyoming set up the Asia Pacific Trade Office, right. APTO. And so we actually reached out to them of like, hey, you guys ever thought about alcohol as yeah. an idea? Because you know, we'd done some market research, had no idea what we were gonna do in the export. And so we started working with the Wyoming Business Council, figuring out what does that actually look like. Right. And went over there in 2019, set some things up, it all collapsed during COVID. And since then we've been working on it to rebuild it out. Uh, but yeah, we actually utilize, that's probably the most heavily, heavy stuff we've done with the Business Council is that export program. So as an entrepreneur and, and somebody who started out not doing this, and, and started out as a, maybe, you know, you wanted to brew some alcohol of sorts, you wanted yep. to make alcohol, and then you went into business. And so you've, you've pivoted a bunch of times and we'll jump back into the whole Asia Pacific thing. But, but tell me a little bit about the transition from somebody who maybe likes to make stuff to somebody who now is working with paper and doing the administration of, of things. How, what's the, what's the difference there? Uh, it's actually not as intense as you would think it is. You're still making something. Yeah. You're just making it in a very different avenue. Okay. And so, you know, the days of literally pulling honey out of drums with our hands, trying to make this yeah. stuff and getting into the distribution market and bottling and making beer. And, you know, that's all fun. You know, that right. exercises a lot of the creative mind. But at the same time, you know, now I've kind of transitioned completely into the administrative side. So it's long-term strategy planning, accounting, legal, regulation, marketing, taxes, you know, everything else that keeps everything else afloat. Right. And uh, so my business partner, Bob, so he wasn't with me at the beginning. It was just me and then, you know, whoever I could get to help me. <laughs> but uh, like during construction, um, he started dating my sister. I didn't have a real good history with her boyfriends. And so uh, <laughs> she would send him down to come hang out. He had a carpentry background and he's a teacher. Yep. And because we built the place from scratch, you know, right. did all the renovation by hand because we didn't have any money to do anything else. Well, he kind of morphed into my right hand man. Once he married my sister, then I asked him if he wanted to be part of the company. And so he's now all operations. So he's taken a lot of that. Um, but one thing that I think uh, a lot of people that have been in that boat can relate to is how it's not so much, you know, how's the transition going moving forward, right. but how well do you let go of what you have yeah. and transitioning that control, right. especially when you're a sole owner mm -hmm. and everything is you. Right. And that's the best part about it. I mean, your failures are yours, right. your successes are yours too. Yeah. And so, you know, if one of your employees does something that costs you a lot of money, that's your fault for not yeah. training them. That's right. not their fault. Right. You didn't show them how to do it. Yep. And so I enjoy having my own failures. Right. I come from a very paramilitary background where that's not always the case. And so it's very nice having that. Well, then when you bring somebody on, how do you let go productively? Right. Um, and I will say Bob was very good. He understood that it's going to take a little while. This isn't just like, okay, Bob, have right. at it. I'm going right. to go do this. Right. It doesn't work that way. Yep. And so it took a long time to make that transition, but it was very productive and Bob was very helpful with that. Yeah. Um, and now it's to the point where you know, I probably rely more on Bob than the antithesis yeah. because like, do Bob, like I don't have time for day to day. And so like, he is a rock star. Right. 
and then the rest of our staff, they really help. I mean, if I go behind the bar right now, I have no idea what's going on back there. That's a whole new topic for me. It was like, I go back there and my bartender's like, Sam, just leave. Yeah. Go talk to people, go do that, like get out of our way. Yeah, yeah let us work. Right, yeah, that, that's a very big transition to make that I think a lot of people don't think about is the right. letting go side, not okay. so much the where you're going forward. Yeah. That part's easy, that's exciting, it's creative, it's fun, you're building this thing. Right. But letting go is the hard part. Can you let go? Right. And can you allow others to be masters at their craft? Yeah. And and learn new ways of doing things and, and you know, be successful without your hands in it. That's interesting. And I, I would guess that a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with that. Oh, I, I guarantee it. Because, yeah. I mean, you sink your entire life into right. something, all your savings, you put your house online, you do yeah. all this stuff. Yeah. And then like, oh, yeah, somebody else take this take it whatever and, that and is. make it into something that maybe doesn't fit your vision but maybe it does it really well right like maybe yeah. they do it even better which is a, again it's a tough thing for entrepreneurs oh. to do well it's one of those things like you know if you do your job right the vision stays consistent the objectives right. the goals the way yeah. the thing looks stays consistent if you do it right yep but if they may not do it the same way and so can you handle that here again. like that's not how i do that right Right. And that's tough. Yeah. And so I get, you know, I was, Bob was very helpful to help me get through that of like, it's not going to be the same way you do it, Sam. That's yeah. okay. Yeah. That's it's actually not. a good metaphor for a, a lot of the things that we do. And so you've been in, you've been in business for a decade almost, right? Is that right? Yeah. And the next year will be a decade. And in the next year will be a decade. Wow. So never yeah. thought about yeah. that way. Yeah. Haven't used that terminology. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. I didn't mean that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's exciting because uh, that you know, not many people make it that far. But, you know, you're a success that it takes a 10-year runway to make, right? Sometimes that stuff takes some time. Oh. And, uh, and you're probably not, probably not where you want to be. And you're we are probably still not, revving up the engine on the right away. Well, and, and we'll, we'll talk about that. But I think one of the things that, that I've seen in economic development is that it takes a long time to do these things. It takes people that maybe are at the beginning of something, maybe have to let some things go or, or remember that the vision is what it's all about, not necessarily the means to it. And so figuring that out, I think that's a pretty good metaphor for, for a lot of the things that, that oh, we're yeah. trying across the state. And um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the, the percentages of your business that are in Wyoming versus the rest of the United States versus this, you know, kind of like new market outside of the U.S., yeah, I'm gonna go back to one thing yeah, real quick absolutely. on that whole uh, that transition phase and that long term, you know, keeping that vision forward. The other thing I think a lot of people forget when they get into business yeah. is it's very easy to get business fatigue as you get to that four, five, seven, six. You know, every yeah. industry is different on what time frame that is. Yeah. We see it a lot in our industry. You know, people are running kind of super easy the first couple of years. Like you're excited, you're excited. Unless yeah. you're battling cash flow, you're battling you know, all the things that don't work that you didn't see coming. Right. But being able to stick through that and understanding that there is something on the other side, that fatigue hits hard, whether it's you and your family fatigue, whether it's your personal time and effort, whatever that is, yeah. whether you just get tired of like trying to fight for the same sale over and over right. and over, but keeping that going and having the discipline to get through the fatigue is huge. And economic development's the same way. Like it's very easy to just like get demoralized in economic mm -hmm. development because it's a hyper complex issue yep. that if you don't stick through mm -hmm. that, that fatigue is going to hit and you see it in you know, the people that work in your oh, industry absolutely. happens all the time. You bet. Because you're so, dealing with politics and economics and business sure. owners and you know, normal civilian life that's trying to give you all this input yeah. and trying to manage that, the constant input has yep. got to be taxing. It's it's interesting. Um, I think you're, the, the parallels are there. So. I, I've only been in this role for, for about four years now, so I don't have that fatigue yet. So, or actually it's only been three, so um, I'm hoping for four. Uh, so, uh, so it's only been three. So tell me some of your tricks that, that helped you through that, that fatigue. Like what, what keeps you going? Cause so we've, we've been able to spend some time here at the, at the meadery today and, and yeah. not only, you know, see the front, front of the house, but also come back to the production. And it's really clear that you have a ton of passion for it. And so how do you keep that going through that slog? Crystal clear focus. Okay. Like we know exactly where we are going. We don't necessarily know the path on okay. how we're getting there, but this is much, much stronger than the trials and tribulations and roadblocks, everything else along the way. Because I think what happens is, is, you know, people start off with a vision, but it's not entirely focused. Mm -hmm. And they have a general idea. This is where we right. want to go. This is where we want to be. 
Yeah. And I think sometimes they may not make it tall enough. They may not make yeah. it high enough. Right. Or they make it so high that all of a sudden they get to the point like, this is good. This is right. good. Like we, we're successful. We're doing our thing. But then they lose that drive for to to that that whatever level. that is. Yeah. And so like since day one, we've had a very crystal clear focus on where we're going. Okay. And so as we start meandering and falling off the trail and tripping and breaking legs and wheel axles and everything else that stops you along the way, there's always been that there. Um, but you know, like when families came along, we started this as single dudes. Yep. And so now we have wives, we, we both have toddlers. Yep. And so that has obviously taken a huge time drain it's not a drain by any means. Like that's hyperly more important, right. but actually it cleared up this cleared up even vision. more right. because now right. we're doing that for this, not just for us. Right. And so we want to leave these kids something that they can now take and throw that thing even further out right. and teach them how to get there. Right. And so it's actually added more oomph. Yeah. It's taken time away and, and from And clarity this. on that vision, which is cool. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's having that crystal clear focus and clarity, then the not, not the rest of it matter. That's part of the game. Yeah. But I think if that is fuzzy or if you're kind of shooting for different objectives, yep. it can become very demoralizing very yeah. quick because you're going to hit so many roadblocks. Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the metaphor, actually, I'm glad you brought us back to it because the metaphor is, is spot on. Right. It, it really is that entrepreneur's path. You've got to have that vision. And it may not be crystal clear at the beginning, or at least you may you may have this fuzzy idea. But as you continue to work toward it, it becomes more clear. And then you you kind of can utilize that as the as that beacon as yeah. and then also realize that the path to get there may not may not look like you thought it would, but it's the never. path there. Right. And it's never <laughs> gonna be that way, but having that sort of that, that vision out there. And, and in a lot of ways, that's how you create alignment, right? As you have oh, that yeah. beacon out there where people can start working toward. And so, you know, maybe the parallels with economic development are even more than I thought when we were going to Oh, I think they are. Yeah. I mean, they're very much the same thing, but I mean, it's not even that, it's your marriage. Like if you have a crystal clear focus on what you guys want to be and where you want to go, marriages are not easy, right? right. And yeah. so that helps you get through all that. I mean, I think just having defined purpose yeah. drives you where you need to right. go. So, so like, if you don't mind sharing, what's the, what's the purpose of Big Lost Meadery? What, what is that for you? Yeah. So we're going to be the biggest meadery in the United States. That's, that's where we're headed. Okay. Like we are actively working on that. We have been, it's been a much slower process than I thought because I didn't know a lot of things that it takes, but we're constantly moving towards that. Yep. And so when we do that, I mean, and it's, and it's not going to be necessarily the way you define big matters. Okay. Yeah. And so when I say we're going to be the biggest meter in the United States, like we're going to have more of our brand in more places in the United States than anybody else in the country. Like that's our goals. Put Wyoming right. on the map for right. that. Okay. That's our singular purpose is that. Cool. And so it's not like make X amount of money. It's not do this much production. It's like, no, our singular purpose is have Gillette Wyoming on a brand on more shelves than anything else in the United States for makers. That's our singular goal. Okay. I like that. I like that. And that, you know, that just extends the brand out there. And, yeah. and, and if the quality is there, people are going to keep coming back. So tell me about the, the work to get this into Asia and, and, and not necessarily so much about the, the, the trade office or those, I'm yep. sure there are things that help, but tell me some about the roadblocks that you experienced, some of the interesting challenges that are, that are out there in other countries. Yeah. So, I mean, I think one nice thing about being in the liquor industry compared to other, you know, most other industries is we have a massive regulatory burden in the liquor industry. And I think that's one thing that shuts a lot of people off on export is how do I navigate tariffs and customs and regulation and shipping and logistics and supply, right. you know, this whole chain of events that has to occur to get product A to product B or point A to point B. Right. And so for us, that, that really wasn't that daunting of a task. Like we didn't see it as this mountain. Okay. We've already spent so much time in the regulatory world on state, local, and federal levels that that's just part of our game is like, you right. have to play that. And so what happens is when we get into export, now we're just dealing with a different type of regulation, but we actually lose a lot of our local regulation okay. goes out the doors. So we don't have to deal with a lot of our federal stuff anymore other than just traditional export things. Okay. I know mean, there's a few other things when it comes to, you know, certificates and paperwork, but it's really not that complex. 
And so I think a lot of people when they get into export think of this just behemoth of a task. Right. But it's really not. You sit there and break down the pieces. It's not that difficult. It just seems like it. And it seemed like it initially to us, but once we got into it, we like, oh, it's more regulation. It's and so that's a, deal that's a barrier to, to entry for competition, it's a huge right? Barrier and to so entry. now you, you're through that. Yeah. And so for us, like once we started down that, now, you know, there was other things we had to learn. Like international shipping is very, very different than domestic shipping. Okay. So we're not, you know, dealing in CIF or FOB quotes and, you know, all these business terms that we mm-hmm. didn't yeah, traditionally we didn't use yeah. and dealing with the harmonized code system. And so for us, like it took a little while to learn some of the dynamics of it and some of the nomenclature and, you know, exactly calling people when you need to call them and things of that nature. But once you pick those up, it's just, it's putting pieces into the same puzzle. And so once we got that figured out, like, okay, now timing and costing, you know, because when you think about export, you think like, okay, I see a tariff here. I see what I need to make and what my product cost is. I think I know what I can put on the shelf, but I think a lot of people don't realize there's a lot of other middlemen in between that create between. cost. And mm-hmm. so, you know, insurance on freight, right. you know, you don't have your blanket domestic policy like we have here. So if I ship stuff to Iowa, it doesn't, right. I don't have to pay insurance on that. I have right. a blanket policy that covers me in the United States, doesn't cover me in Southeast Asia. So now I insure product from San Francisco to Taipei. And so things of that nature, you know, trying to figure out those little nuances. Right. Yeah. Um, and then I think one of the biggest things that also turns people off to export is language. Okay. You know, we are a homogenized language group in right. the United States for the most part. Right. And so a lot of people don't play in those different ball games, especially here in Wyoming. Right. And so for us, you know, we, we had spent a lot of time around the world doing other things anyway. And so it wasn't a huge burden for us to speak in broken English, for instance, or trying to do business in writing with translation in between, because translation is not A to A. No. In any language. That's right. Specifically with, you know, Mandarin and English, do not translate. Localization is a big deal, right? Yeah, Yeah. it's huge. And so, you know, that wasn't a too big of one for us because spent a lot of time overseas. And so it was very easy to make that. And culturally to get through some of those um, probably the single toughest thing for us is in the craft liquor industry in the United States, it's very much people are in t-shirts, jeans, you know, a lot of bro deals yeah. and very informal business. Yeah. Asia is very different. Asia is mm-hmm. very formal business. Mm-hmm. Right. And so there's a way things get done. There's a way that you do quoting. There's a way that you dress, way you talk, way you deal with your business cards. Like there's a lot of mm-hmm. cultural business aspects that we were not used to. Right. Now, somebody working in corporate America, that's a lot less moving out to Southeast Asia. Right. Bunch of cowboys from Wyoming, that's a huge transition. So that did take a little while to get through that educational okay. process on the cultural side of how to do business. Yeah. You know, culturally going over was very easy. Culturally how to do business was not. So one of the big benefits we saw is it actually upped our game here Mm-hmm. We had to be a little more precise in how we talked business, on how we talked language, how we used our right. nomenclature, how we discussed right. P&Ls and balance sheets. And so it actually upped our game here. Right. Now we're still just T-shirt cowboys doing business around the United States. But at the same time, we have that in our back pocket that we didn't have earlier. Right. Which was good. Right. And so, so let's talk about that because, you know, for the last, you know, few minutes... You've talked nothing about making mead, Mm-mm. right? And so I, I want to talk about that because capabilities and building capabilities on capabilities is one of the ways that you can really help develop an economy. And so kind of getting all those capabilities put together. So now that you have capabilities to export a product into Southeast Asia you know, or the Asian market, now think about are there other ways that you can, uh, other ways that you can serve that market? Are there other things that you could do as a Wyomingite to maybe address a market or a need with things that are around. And so basically you're taking that capability yeah. that you learned with mead, but you're able to turn it into something that could be, you know, even different. Maybe it's different and continue to grow. Yeah. So, I mean, like, you know, the mead world, like we're, we're fairly narrow in, right. when it comes to product. Right. Right. You know, we can sell experiences and there's other things we can do that are very ancillary to that, but yeah. it's very much very narrow. Right. But when it comes to Wyoming in that world, 
Wyoming has a lot of natural assets. Mm -hmm. And we have some very unique assets that don't exist, especially in a hyper-populated area. Right. And, you know, like coming from July, you know, we talk about our alternative carbon uses, you know, the way that we deal with power, the way that we deal with coal, the way we deal with our natural, you know, immediate natural resources. But what we can do from there and take that to the next step. Right. And so, you know, I know you guys at the Business Council have been working on this a lot. And a lot mm -hmm. of economic development has been, you know, our energy capital here has been working on it. But I think a lot of it is getting over the mental barrier mm -hmm. of the state as a collective yep. that this is actually a thing. Right. And so, like, you know, for me personally, the way I see what my best asset for that is advocacy. Okay. I mean, it's strictly advocacy. I think right. that's the single biggest thing because I'm not an expert in coal and alternative energy technology. That's not me. Right. Um, and I'm not an expert in export either, by any means. We have people at the business but council gone, that are much, much better. barriers that a lot of people haven't. Yeah, but like here, we know how to get over that. Yeah. And so I think being that advocate, because we have really cool product coming out of Wyoming, mm -hmm. but I think when a lot of people think of export, they think of consumer level product. Right. They don't think of the below consumer level which is what Wyoming special ed, we don't have a lot of consumer product outside the state. Right. Very, very little, domestic or internationally. And so when most people talk about export, they're like, well, yeah, you know, Coca-Cola sells X number of units in China and da 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 da, -da. Like, that's, not, that's not Wyoming, that's not who right. we are. Right. What assets do we have that can facilitate economic growth in another nation, which in turn feeds the economic growth here? Right. I mean, because yeah, that money comes back here, right? Yeah. Like that's outside money coming into our. Yeah, I mean, if we become our entire company becomes Asian, yeah. our entire product goes to Asia. That's great. Yeah, I'll do that all day long because yeah. that's bringing stuff back to right. Wyoming that's specifically. Right. That's right. And so I think when people need to think about it is how do we get past this? Can we have to be consumer level product to move? Mm -hmm. Think about what we specialize in. Right. You know, Taiwan. You have 32 million people on the size of New Jersey. Yeah. What do they need? They need things like power. Yeah. They need things like rubber, yeah. steel, coal. I mean, there's so many things yeah. outside of consumer level product. Yeah. And that's what who we are. Well, and the other thing you mentioned there is that you're looking at the market. You're, you're saying, what is the market? What is the, the market first, not product first, right? Yes. Like, what does the market need? What could we deliver? What, how could we get through that? And, and kind of having that know-how to get there. And, and a lot of that is gained by trial and error and being willing to take on that, that challenge yeah. and, and work through it. And Mead happened to be the vehicle to do that. It's the only but, vehicle we yeah, had. Yeah, it's the vehicle you had. Uh, but you know what's, what's super interesting, Sam, is that this conversation, I didn't think it was going to parallel economic development as much as it has. And I didn't think it was going to show all of the elements that it does. And it's pretty, it's pretty cool that we could take a single business with a single focus and really kind of use it as a metaphor for what we're trying to do throughout the state. So this is, this is a, a super, super interesting discussion. Well, good. I'm glad. But if yeah. you think about it, I mean, economic development and business are the same thing. Your platform and your area is just infinitely more complex. You know, you're not worried about, you know, I've got 360 million people I could potentially sell to in the United States. Right. You're not looking at it like that, but how many different assets from you know, what happens at the federal level that affects Wyoming's ideology or Wyoming's politics or revenue sources or whatever it is, or economic development. A lot of people see it as like, oh yeah, you know, it's just this thing. If we bring in this business, yeah, it's dude, we're done. We're done, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, no, how do you support yeah. that business through infrastructure, through housing, yeah. through hospitality? Right. Like, do they want to live here, their workers? That's right. Not just do they want the yeah. tax base that we give. Yeah. And so those are all business problems, just on an infinitely more complex you know, base. And the way we, and the, and the way kind of to bring this, you know, kind of to put a little bow around it, the way we deal with all that complexity is exactly what you were saying earlier. We have a really clear focus on building resilient communities. And yeah. if you focus all of your effort on that, the rest of it sort of takes care of itself. Yeah. It's, it's a, this has probably been one of my most enlightening and uh, enjoyable <laughs> conversations. Well, I'm so, glad. Sam, thanks. thanks I'm enjoying for your this. time. Yeah, Thank absolutely. You. It's great. It was fun. Cool.